can you uh, unmute and then uh, I want to check whether uh, the people there on the Zoom, uh, can you hear me? Uh, Prof Khalid, uh, can you hear us? Uh, unmute, I think. Yes, yes, Prof, I can hear you clearly. Can you hear me? Alhamdulillah, yeah, yeah, you are okay. Okay, Alhamdulillah. And also in the YouTube, I think other people will be following also there. Uh, let me see here. Okay, let me see again. Okay. Uh, Prof, uh, shall we start? Yes. Please. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Good morning. Uh, first of all, let us uh, welcome our professor. Uh, we are very much honored to have uh, Professor Dr. Kai Yon Chang. Yes from the uh, Institute of Philosophy of Mind and Cognition, National Yang Ming Chiotong University, Taiwan. This is really uh, a great honor uh, to have such a great professor with us here. And uh, before I uh, give you an introduction about uh, our uh, Stack World Professorial Lecture number 20, I would like to welcome all the participants, the scholars, the researchers, the students who are with us uh, in the Zoom and in the YouTube, and also those who are with us here in uh, Ibn Khaldun conference room at the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization, IIUM, Malaysia. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, dear participants, this is the uh, Stack World Professorial Number 19. And we have already conducted 18 professorial uh, lectures since uh, last year. Mm. And we have engaged many scholars, experts, and professors, ambassadors. And in fact, one of the speakers in this Stack World Professorial Lecture was the former Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. Mm. He delivered one lecture here and many other uh, people from different countries, from Malaysia here and from US, Canada, the Arab world, and here in Asia. This uh, Stack World Professorial Lecture engages scholars, uh, experts, professionals, ambassadors, and all those people who have something of wisdom and experience to offer to us, the learners of knowledge. Alhamdulillah, with the grace of God, today we, have, we are having our professor, Kai, here. I think the topic 
of discussion is a wonderful topic. That's why when Dr. Ayn, our great sister here, mentioned to me about it, I immediately say, please get Professor to address us here. Uh, uh, today, in fact, this institute is having in this week five functions. And today, in our main campus, our institute is organizing an international conference on the uh, on the uh, on Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman's thought and contribution to the reform of educational system and the, in the intellectual. So this is also another great event today in this time. And tomorrow we have another lecture. And on 27, we will be having another forum. That's why our people uh, in the Zoom and in the YouTube, uh, once again, I welcome you. And now I hand over the uh, mic to our doctor, Ayn, to be the moderator for the IWPL number 19. Go ahead, sister. Thank you very much, Prof. Aziz. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and welcome to the 19th Islamic World Professor Lecture Day. We are delighted to have you all again here, uh, whether physically or virtually, gracing our 19th session uh, for today. And we want to thank you for your constant uh, support since um, last year. So, our session today is uh, co organized by the Malaysian Association for the Education of Philosophy and Thinking. And we're very honored to have a special guest all the way from Taiwan. And thank you very much, Professor Dr. Kai Wansheng for accepting our invitation. And so ladies and gentlemen, our topic today is about integrating uh, disciplines. Uh, our topic today is about integrating disciplines for impactful research, neurophilosophy, culture, and uh, civilization. So we have uh, several important keywords for today where we will look upon the power of uh, integrating disciplines, whether making it multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, or transdisciplinary in designing or creating something called uh, impactive, productive, uh, efficacious, significant, dynamic, or name it all, you know, extraordinary research. To be more precise, it will be featured as a method or an approach for doing research. So this kind of approach does not come into uh, different silo boxes, uh, but a creative uh, crisscross among disciplines, which gives us a wider perspective of various complex problems and grand challenges that begin to arise uh, in the world today, such as hunger, you know, energy, climate issues, and so forth which brings upon a more uh, sustainable, holistic, inclusive, and best possible uh, solution. Now we are honored to have with us Professor Dr. Kai Yuan Cheng from the Institute of Philosophy of Mind and Cognition, National Yang Ming Chiao Tang University, Taiwan, who will create ties between the three fields of research, which are neurophilosophy, um, which later uh, Prof. Kai will, will more explain on this, culture and Civilization. But before that, let me introduce our great guest here. Kai Yuan Sheng obtained her Bachelor of Science from the Department of Civil Engineering, National uh, Chao Tong University, Taiwan, in 1992, and PhD from the Graduate Institute of Philosophy, City University of New York, in 2002. He was formally associate dean between 2012 and 2015, and dean of School of Humanities and Social Sciences between 2015 and 17. He was the vice president um, and dean of Office of Student Affairs of National Young Ming University between 2019 20, and is currently professor at the Institute of Philosophy of Mind and Cognition National Young Ming Chao Tung University in Taipei, Taiwan. And he's a member of advisory committee of Hmong Nash Center for Consciousness and Contemplative Studies in Melbourne, Australia. He was visiting faculty at the Divinity School of University of Chicago and Royal Batawa Mental Health Center of University of Ottawa, Canada in the year 2018-19, and will be a visiting fellow at the School of Philosophical, Historical, and International Studies of Monash University in 2023. So he's uh, you know transiting here in Malaysia, and we have the opportunity 
to be with uh, us today. He is a recipient of several prestigious research awards in Taiwan, including Wu Da Yu Memorial Award from National Science Council in 2010, Young Investigator Award from Academia Sinica 2011, and Distinguished Research Award from National Science Council 2012. His area of research lies in philosophy of language and mind, metaphysics, uh, Wittgenstein, uh, Zhang Zi, and your philosophy. Without further ado, I, I take pleasure to invite Professor Dr. Kai Wan Sheng to deliver his talk. Okay, um, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm so honored and um, uh, also so humble uh, to speak here. And I have to thank uh, Dean and uh, Dr. Ann and uh, Dr. Adino uh, for making this uh, visit possible. Uh, so today I would like to share uh, some of my most uh, recent uh, developments uh, in my research uh, to you, and I hope that would be relevant uh, to um, our common interest. So um, let me address um, some of our major challenges of our time. Um, traditional Traditions and cultural roots uh, seems to lose their ground and become irrelevant to younger generations. Uh, at least that's what I observe uh, in Taiwan, uh, in the culture that I, that I come from. And advances in science and technology seem to accelerate in bringing human existence into alienated consumers of effectiveness and pleasures and earth into age of destruction like look at uh, climate change or the financial crisis worldwide, uh, once every year uh, nowadays. And then there are also some major crises of our time, like how are traditional classics relevant in a contemporary context? And how are published works in the academics not locked inside the ivory town due to their tending to be trivial and fragmentary? I was talking to some of my colleagues in the finance department, good friends, and uh, he told me that, one of them told me that uh, his works, his papers, like grading A level, I know university are trivial. So I, th I think that's the kind of uh, uh, feeling that is so specialized that it kind of lose the, the bigger picture uh, of our world and our concern. Um, and so it's a, a crisis also to um, scholars in our time. So um, before I start, uh, let me uh, uh, introduce something about me, uh, my background in my university. Uh, as Dr. Ann has just introduced, uh, I had an engineering background and I had this background mainly because uh, like other young people uh, in Taiwan uh, back in the 1990s, um, most um, young men go to engineering uh, because it is a more prominent uh, career, uh, make money, etc. Uh, but uh, when I look back, uh, it's a good training. Uh, engineering is very solid, uh, down to earth. So there's something good about it. And then um, I but somehow it did not satisfy me because um, engineering concerns um, mostly about the material world, about the mechanical laws that govern uh, the, the material world. But there is a, a much larger um, world, which is the mental and spiritual world that uh, concerns me more. So later on, I discovered that philosophy is probably a more proper area for me to uh, dedicate it to. So I continue uh, to study philosophy, uh, PhD uh, in New York. And it took me eight years to complete my study. Uh, it's uh, such a long suffering, uh, but joyful journey. Thank God I survived. <laughs> and then I uh, um, started to teach at a medicine-based uh, National Yami University uh, it, it is uh, one of the best uh, medical schools in Taiwan. Um, and it was merged uh, with the engineering based university where I graduated from. Right? I would never imagine I would 
go back to my home university after 20 years. Uh, must be a joke. Um, so, um, and uh, the merge was encouraged under the government because um, the government wants Taiwan to develop further its industry. And both is, is uh, electronic and information engineering has kind of reached its peak. And also the medicine attracts the most talented young people in the country. And it has also matured. So now they want to combine these two areas uh, to uh, for the next 20 years or 30 years or 50 years of development. So I'm working in this uh, academic environment where I think humanities and, uh, and social science uh, have become ever more important than before. That's my feeling. So um, how did I get into doing neurophilosophy? Uh, because from what I said, uh, neuroscience uh, was not my specialty. I was studying uh, civil engineering not biology, not medicine. Um, so there's something that happened that uh, um, that made me go into this track. Uh, but I have to say that uh, engineering and philosophy kind of prepare me for taking up this track because engineering is a, a, a area of study that synthesizes different disciplines. Right, engineers don't have to invent F equals MA by themselves, and they don't have to invent mathematics by themselves, but they have to creatively synthesize mathematics and physics in order to build bridges. Right? The, me the me mechanics of which is very complicated. Actually, it takes uh, a lot of training um, and uh, creativity. So I think that kind of training uh, gave me uh, have this kind of flexibility uh, to keep learning. So, um, so I got into neurophilosophy actually through something like that I did not expect, Chinese philosophy. That is not in my proper academic training. Okay, so let me explain what happens. So what happened was that in 2009, after I survived my tenure, I uh, got promoted to associate professor. I had a chance to uh, to be a visiting scholar at Princeton University, where uh, my host, uh, Mark Johnston, was writing his book at that time, two books. One is called Surviving Death. The other is called Saving God. And it's a very naturalistic view of salvation. And uh, later on, he actually told me, um, that when he was growing up, he belonged to the Jesuit um, church. So that is uh, uh, some of the most intellectual uh, uh, Christian uh, tradition in Europe. Um, so he has always been very religious, but at the same time, very philosophical. So he, when he was 15, he wanted to be a priest, but his philosophical uh, inclination was obviously more powerful. So he went to, into philosophy. So he did all the major work in analytic philosophy and, um, and did very well and became a chair professor at Princeton. But then he told me that he want, he want to write something that is really important to him. So he started to write the two books in philosophy of religion, which somehow inspired me into Chinese philosophy, even though he was talking nothing about Chinese philosophy. Right? But when you talk about salvation, you have to talk about self and person. Who is it that gets saved? So it's me, but who is me? So it's a self, but who, what is a self? In the scientific um, viewpoint, so when I heard about his thinking, suddenly I uh, think about my ancestor, uh, Zhuangzi, the ancient Chinese philosopher 2000 years ago. He had a 
very beautiful story, the dream of the butterfly, that every kid in the, not just the Chinese tradition, um, like in Asia or Taiwan, but also in East Asia, uh, in Japan and Korea, knows about the story. Uh, when I went to Tokyo and, 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 and uh, Seoul to, to talk about my I did a sort of idea about the dream of the butterfly. They would ask me to start. You don't have to explain the story. We all know that. <laughs> so that, that is our common heritage in East Asia. So, and the story is so beautiful, but so obscure. That we knew it when we were children, but we never know what it means. And even when I grow up, I don't think about it, and I still don't know what it means. So let me read it to you just to have a feeling. One strong dog dreamed he was a butterfly. Suddenly he woke, and there he was. The startled strong dog in the flesh. Okay. He did not know if strong dog had been dreaming he was a butterfly or if a Butterfly was now dreaming he was so Very strange, right? <laughs> so in the dream, he was like a butterfly, you know, like flying around very happily, not knowing Zhuang Zhou himself. But then he woke up and started to think, am I dreaming of the butterfly? This is okay. Or the butterfly dreaming of me, this is not okay. <laughs> Right. And this story is so famous throughout the Chinese tradition. Everyone knows it. When I was a kid, hearing the story, I feel dizzy. <laughs> but I don't know where that come from. But for the first time, when I was almost 40 years old, when I was sitting in Mark Johnson's class, explaining the salvation and the self, I got a strong feeling that the dream of the butterfly is about the self, the nature of self. So I, uh, I spent um, two weeks, I rushed to the library of Princeton and I uh, retrieved all the papers on the dream of the butterfly right? in philosophy, in classics, in the past 40 years. So it was a pile. And then I went through all of them. And almost none of the paper talking about the dream of the butterfly as connected to the nature of self. Almost none. And I saw so I was so happy. I, I had a major discovery that I probably can make some contribution in this field. A field I was not properly trained at all, only as a kid. So then I uh, spent another half a year um, working out an academic paper. So later on, uh, I submitted it to uh, Philosophy East and West, uh, probably one of the best journals uh, in the English speaking world um, in uh, Chinese philosophy. And I really had the confidence that, I mean, if the journal did not accept my paper, the journal must be very bad. <laughs> Luckily, they, they accepted the paper. So, um, so that's the starting point when I um, started to do <clears throat> Chinese philosophy connected to my roots. So it was the first time, honestly speaking, that I failed my training in engineering and Western philosophy was a preparation for me to get to know my own culture. It takes 20 years. And around the same time, I encountered uh, this German um, um, scholar who is uh, now working in Canada. And uh, he has three degrees, uh, one in medicine. Uh, he studied medicine because he wants to study subjectivity. That is his major concern. How come there is a uh, subjective feeling in the universe. So he studies psychiatry. 
Um, and then later on, uh, brain science started to emerge. So he went on to study brain science and got a PhD. And uh, to study subjectivity, you have to know philosophy uh, in the Western context. So he went on to study for another uh, PhD in philosophy. So combining the three areas, uh, he studied human mind. So um, also about 10 years ago, I met him in a um, conference uh, in Taiwan. And uh, he asked me what I do. I said, I do philosophy of self. And he said, uh, can you send me your papers? I would like to read it. And I said, yes. Um, but my research on self is on Chinese philosophy, on Zhuangzi. And he said, that's okay, uh, please send me. Mm -hmm. So I sent it to him. And in two days, he brought me back with six pages of comments, right? And saying that he loved Zhuangzi. But in the end, he disagreed about the view of self in Zhuangzi. He said his ancestor, German philosopher Kant, it's better. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, that, that's okay. That is fair. And that's where we started to collaborate. He wanted to collaborate he, because he, he sees something very deep in um, Asian philosophy through Zhuangzi. So, um, so we, we uh, collaborate uh, collaborate through the 10 years. So my new philosophy is a kind of a joint venture with him. So let me briefly uh, introduce his work. And also let me make a confession that I know so little about brain science that is embarrassing to acknowledge, right? But he knows it, <laughs> so, okay. But we talk to each other. And the specialty, uh, of course I leave it to him to work, he's an expert. So what I provide is uh, insight in Chinese philosophy that fits perfectly with his view of the brain. And the view of the brain requires some ontological understanding, some philosophical understanding. What is this brain? What is this organ? It's not so simple. And he's a philosopher. And he, he needs to do proper science to conduct empirical study about it. And there are so many data. He needs to have a perspective to analyze the data. And how to analyze the data depends fundamentally on how you view the nature of the brain. If you view the nature of the brain as an isolated organ, as a substance by itself, then you will have a certain way of measuring what happened in the brain. But if you view the brain not just as a substance, but as a relational being, like a Heidegger being in the world, for example, right? it's not an isolated organ, but it's part of a bigger world, then you will have a totally different way of looking at the brain and measuring at what is going on there. Right. And obviously the second view of the brain, the ontologically relational nature of the brain is what he believes. And the world is crucial in this relation, the world. And very sadly, uh, Dr. Nordhoff told me that when he gave the uh, his research in the Western world, they don't understand him. They don't know what he's talking about. He, he told me that the Western people, they don't understand the world. The world could, is just contingent to the existence of a human. A human, a person, the rational mind is the most primary, just like the cards. Right. The physical world can be put into doubt as secondary. Even my physical body can be put into doubt as secondary. And the rational thinking mind is the most fundamental primary existence. So the world could be forgotten. Right. 
And uh, that influence is very deep into uh, contemporary thinking, not just in philosophy, but also in science. Right. So when Dr. Nothoff bring the world back to the study of the brain, the audience uh, in the uh, Western world has, have a hard time understanding him. Right. That's what he told me personally. And when he gave his research uh, talk in the Asian world, in China, in Japan, in Taiwan, yeah. people were like not studying, but saying what's the problem? <laughs> Very natural. Okay. So um so what I did was to provide a analytic uh philosophical reconstruction of Zhuangzi to him. And then he absorbed the 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 ideas and work to work together uh to incorporate into his brain science right. of course he also relies on uh, resources in western philosophy like Heidegger or like Whitehead process-based ontology or um Kant he also rely on Kant because Kant is a very sophisticated philosopher yeah, who not notice about the, the boundary between uh, metaphysics and epistemology. So Kant is very careful. We'll talk about him a little bit later. But in the end, he thinks that these Western philosophers, they, they, they still have some um, obstacle to entirely um, throw away um, the kind of substance-based ontology. Yeah. Or, or, or the taking thinking as the fundamental uh, feature. So in this view, uh, Zhuangzi, uh, the, the Asian worldview, um, give the, 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 the most perfect ontology that he means. So that's how we work together. So, so, so I provided the Eastern philosophical idea and he worked on the brain science and together with uh, um, his lab and our students, so that I will discuss uh, later. Okay, so so you get the overall idea. So the rest is a little bit of uh, the short briefing of what's going on. Some of it would be technical. So um, I just show it so you, are, you, you get some idea. If you are interested, you can look into uh, his papers to get the more detailed ideas. So ten years ago. Uh, Dr. Nothoff was already uh, talking about the spontaneous activities of the cortical midline structure of the brain and call it as a neural predisposition. And the activity is a necessary condition for self and consciousness. So the spontaneous activity of the brain refers to uh, the brain when it does not do any cognitive function. Right. Usually when you are uh, playing tennis or when you are doing the mathematics, uh, you are involving in some kind of uh, um, functions. So the neuroscientists, they will study which area of the brain that will get activated and then find the correlation between the, between the brain activity and the function. That's the typical. But Dr. Nothoff, pay attention to a very fundamental phenomenon of the brain, which is when the brain does not do anything, just we call resting state. When you are not playing tennis, when you are not doing uh, mathematics, you just uh, rest. In the resting state of the brain is the spontaneous activity of the brain. He studied this phenomenon. And so for, for the mainstream neuroscience, this is uh, crazy because what is there to study? But that is his hypothesis. His hypothesis is that self is related to the spontaneous activity of the brain. In the monologically, we feel that self is always with us. We are always there. Why? Because it's the spontaneous activity of the brain. So, not much, it's very 
intriguing innovative perspective on the study. Okay. So uh, in 2009 or 12, so I published in Cell, a top journal, uh, Immanuel Kant's mind and the brain sweating state. So that's why I always hope our medical student and uh, science student, they can write a, a paper on drugs and the brain. Uh, that, of course, you, you, you cannot see at least not now. But uh, for German uh, scientists, like Dr. Nothoff, he got the inspiration from Kant. Because Kant introduced um, the idea of the mind that it has uh, some of the most basic conditions which makes the human knowledge possible. And the most basic uh, condition involves categories and intuition. And there are 12 categories that include causation, cause and effect. And intuition includes space and time. So the stimuli coming from the world will get processed by these basic categories and intuitions and get molded into uh, the kind of human knowledge that we produce. So he twisted the idea of Kant and adapted it to his brain science, hypothesizing that the brain has a similar basic condition in order to produce self and consciousness. Right? And the basic condition of the brain is a spontaneous activity of the brain. So that is his basic idea. Okay. So it's an example to show that to do really innovative science, um, philosophy is relevant. Okay. So here's a more elaborate uh, 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 view. Um, his uh, theory in this uh, unlocking the brain. So his view, I uh, call this a uh, neural predisposition view that he is, is, was inspired by Kant is in a sharp contrast to the dominant approach in the current mainstream neuroscience called NCC, neural corridors of consciousness. Co consciousness. Right? The neural corridors was what we were talking about trying to find a correlation between the brain activities and the functions. So the brain as a neural correlates of consciousness would be considered as a sufficient condition. I mean, the brain itself as an isolated organ, if you give it proper stimulation, it will be sufficient for consciousness. And this is not a view that he accepts. So NCC is the view that the brain is ontologically an organ, the neural activity of which are sufficient to bring about consciousness. But this uh, neural predisposition view, the brain is ontologically not just an organ, and by itself only plays a necessary role for consciousness. This neural activity has to work in alignment with the body and the environment to be sufficient. Yes, that's the overall picture. And in 2008, he continued to illustrate the brain and world relation into a world to brain relation. The spontaneous activity has to be looked at in terms of a world to brain relation um, in order to, to understand its nature. So um, from what I see it, he moved away from the brain's intrinsic condition, which is a spontaneous activity, to the world-to-brain relation. And then finally, um, to world-to-brain transformation. I will talk about my relevance here because the idea of transformation comes from Zhuangzi. He got that term from Zhuangzi. And I think that term is much better than relation. And, and then intrinsic uh, condition. So, so that term has officially now occurred in uh, neuroscience in his paper. 
So I'm very happy about it, even though I know nothing about brain science. <laughs> so I'll, I'll talk about it uh, in the following pages. And he got the idea of transformation from reading together uh, with me and some text of Zhuangzi. So it's another beautiful story that every child growing up in the East Asian tradition knows about it. It's about uh, the death of the wife of Zhuangzi. And it's a beautiful story. Let me read it to you. So uh, when his wife died, he looked back to her beginning and the time before she was born. Not only the time before she was born, but the time before she had a body. And not only the time before she had a body, but the time before she had a chi or ki. In the midst of jumble of wonder and mystery, a change took place and she had a chi. Another change and she had a body. Another change and she was born. Now there has been another change and she's dead. It's just that the progression of the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Okay, so when the wife of Zhuangzi died, he was very sad. So then he started to understand why he's so sad. He tried to calm himself. So then he saw that his wife was actually part of the natural transformation by four seasons. If not, she, she's gone. But that's the natural process of where she came from nature. So if I'm sad now, why were, were I not sad in the beginning? So he, through looking at this natural transformation of uh, a, a person, he, uh, he stopped crying. So yeah, it's very uh, sad but beautiful. Um, but it shows the philosophers um, kind of uh, understanding of uh, the human existence. Okay. And Dr. Nosov is very poetic. So he absorbed the notion of transformation and seeing that the perspective from the text is a perspective larger than an individual person. That's most important. It has a temporal dimension that is anchored not in the human individual, but in the natural world. And that is the perspective that inspired Dr. Nordhoff. And the natural world perspective is not a logical perspective, which is commonly taken by the mainstream Western philosophers and scientists. They take a logical perspective, mathematical perspective, and, and place it as a fundamental of human knowledge. But Dr. Nordhoff takes a natural world perspective, not logic. So change is fundamental to his ontology. Logic does not change. So there are meta methodological details to how he carry out this idea. Right? But that is Dr. Nordhoff's general idea. The natural transformation serves as a key component to underst understand the nature of the brain. So, um, so he, he developed this idea uh, into his uh, um, research, which was published uh, three years ago uh, in the Physics of Life Review. Uh, he tried to uh, find a common currency uh, between the brain and mind using the spatial temporal dynamics, which has an idea of change and transformation at its core. And to do that, um, because temporal is so crucial to him, so he has to find different criteria of time in his work. So um, 
this is another uh, sad story, but turned into a, a beautiful one. What happened was that uh, Dr. Nordok wanted to develop the notion of time, and he went back to another ancestor of him, uh, Leibniz. <laughs> That's great. Because he is uh, you know, one of the most important philosophers uh, to talk about space and time. Very nice work. So Dr. Nordok wrote a paper based on Leibniz and his notion of time, connecting the brain and time. And he, he submitted his paper to, um, to, to science journal. And, and they all rejected him, right? Because they, they were saying that, yeah, you are talking about science. Why do you have to talk about Leibniz, <laughs> about philosophy of time? They rejected him. And then he submitted a paper to philosophy journals and again get rejected because the philosophers uh, on the review told him, you are talking about philosophy of Leibniz. Why do you talk about the brain? But do you know that the brain is a contingent uh, organ? What's the relevance of our conceptual analysis? Irrelevance. So, he told me uh, the story, and then I, uh, as a friend, I, I have to respond to him. I say, yeah, um, don't worry, let me try my hero, Zhuangzi. Uh, maybe he has some idea. So I looked at his paper, and I got the three levels of time in Leibniz, like a concept-based time, like mathematical, logical notion of time, one hour, two hours, three hours, one day, two day, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, the conceptual notion of time. And also experience space time. I know that my feeling of time um, um, can be very short when I'm in Malaysia. So there's the experience space time that is different from the concept space time. But also there's the monadic space time. And this time in itself that is now related to concepts or to experience. It's a monadic time. And that is three levels of time in Leibniz. Okay. So I use the framework and start to read Zhuangzi. Right. But before I do that, I ask my colleagues in Chinese philosophy, they are the experts. Because I want to be lazy, I want to rely on them to tell me the resources. I talked to the two best Chinese philosophers in Taiwan. And then they look at the ceiling for 10 seconds. And then they say, no, Zhuangzi did not talk about time. So I cannot get lazy. I have to do the work by myself. So I started to read the text. I find all the three levels of time without much difficulty. So. Um, so we wrote a paper together. So now that a lot of uh, ideas are published through Chinese philosophy. Yeah, who can expect that? Um, so after we publish the paper, uh, we can officially now uh, use the dynamic notion of time, which uh, is there um, in, in Zhuangzi's philosophy. Right, but it also has a presence in some of the Western philosophers. Um, but the basic idea is that um, he wants to, he's not just a brain scientist, he's also a philosopher and a psychiatrist. So he really wants to explain the, the link between the neural activity and the mental features. Right? They are so different, so different. Right, because the neural activities, they are the material. They have the chemical, they have the electronic, but they are very different to our feeling and thinking. So to make it connected, it's really mission impossible. So that's why the dualistic thinking is very difficult to get rid of in the mainstream um, philosophy and science. 
even when you reject the mental phenomenon, I think many neuroscientists simply put it away because it's embarrassing to acknowledge the mental features, the play no role in science. But as a phenomenon, it's real. How can you uh, refuse to accept it as a phenomenon, right? Um, so, but to explain the leaf, you really have to find, despite its difference, you really have to find its common features. And that's what Dr. North of to do. And he called the common features, the common currency. And the idea comes from the finance, right? If you want to understand the financial world, you have to understand American dollars as a common currency of the financial world. Otherwise, you will not get to understand the financial phenomenon. So similarly, you have to try to find a common currency of the brain and the mind. Otherwise, you won't understand what you are looking at. So the challenge is to find the common features of the two. So the most important features for him is space and time, spatial temporal, spatial temporal. So before, I, um, I won't take up too much more time um, yeah, I think 10 minutes would do. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. 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 So generous and so encouraging. Yeah. Um, so before I illustrate his uh, theory, I would like to uh, use my own personal experience as an example to give, uh, give you a, a feeling for his special temporal neuroscience, his theory. So I remember almost 30 years ago, uh, when Taiwan, we had very slow train, the normal train. And uh, so it takes five hours to travel from Kaohsiung to Taipei, from the south to the north. And, but in the 1990s, at that time, we started to have domestic flights. So for the first time, I can take the airplane from Kaohsiung, from Kaohsiung to Taipei. And I still remember um, it took me 15 minutes. And then when I took off from Kaohsiung, and then I was already in Taipei. So I remember when I stand on the ground of Taipei Airport, I feel dizzy. <laughs> this is unreal. Literally, I feel dizzy. It's not real. So, so um, I actually asked Dr. Notov about my understanding of his theory. At a phenomenological level, at a mental level, I have some change of my feeling. And that occurs because at the fundamental level of the neural, the most basic functioning features of the brain is the spatial temporal features, even though the brain looks like weight, like the weight organ, but the way it functions is uh, a temporal organ. Yeah. So, and it has a certain spatial temporal structure there that it fix and influence my experience. And now that structure was disruptured by my flight experience. So somehow I feel that at my new uh, phenomenological level because the fundamental level of the brain um, got shattered in some way. Yeah, Dr. Nautok said, yeah, this is a good example. Right? So you see his uh, way of doing things. Right? As a, his uh, PhD background in philosophy comes from phenomenology. So he tests um, our mental features as, I mean, take it seriously. Um, but they are mental features. Ontologically, he said we have to be careful not to say that ontologically is something 
real. And as the mental features, of course, they exist, they are real. Right? So that's the kind of delicacy that Kant has. Right? We have to be careful not to make a, a fallacious inference move from phenomenology to ontology. That's the kind of strategy he undertakes here. Okay. So going back uh, to the dynamics of space and time. So there are two major views in Western philosophy. One is a contain container view of the time. That time is uh, abstract, but real. It's like a container and all the events takes place in the container of time. That's the Newton's view. But then you also have the constitution, constitution view of time, the dynamic time. So time exists in the change of the event. So time is inherent in the event. Time is not a container outside of the events. Okay, they are the two major different views. And um, Zhuangzi, together with some other uh, Western philosophers like Leibniz and um, Heidegger, they have the constitution or dynamic view of time. Okay, and this is a view of time that Dr. Not of adopt. So this is important for him to look at the depression and many uh, uh, patients. Because in their, in, their, in their brain, their time is constructed and it's uh, for the depression patients, it's slower than the, the time in the world. The, the world has its own time, which it creates by itself. And the world time moves faster than the inner time. So that's why the depression patients, they feel that, that, that uh, when their uh, friends talk to them, they talk too fast, they cannot catch up. So that's why they, they don't react. And, and then they become depressed, even though they are talking normally. So that's a basic idea. And then here is a special temporal mechanism like repertoire, uh, integration, and speed to, to kind of to, to describe uh, the mechanism of the brain. Um, again, there are some details. You, you have to look at his uh, more scientific empirical research, right? But the special temporal repertoire is like, uh, like like a tennis player, you know, when he was preparing to re react to the coming ball, uh, he would move in a certain uh, position to get ready. And that kind of uh, preparatory movements uh, is similar to the brain. The brain will also have its uh, spontaneous activity, which has a similar movement to be ready to react to an incoming stimuli. And that's um, mechanism is called uh, the spatial temporal uh, repertoire. And they have a certain way of measuring it using the entropy and complexity. It's very physics. And also there is a spatial temporal integration. So the time that happens, um, the earlier time would be incorporated into the later time. The times they are continuous and interrelated. Okay, so this kind of feature, they also have like different ways of measuring it. And they, they, they have three ways of uh, describing the kind of uh, uh, temporal dimension called nestiness, uh, continuity, and coupling. And they have different uh, tools to measure it. Okay. And uh, please don't ask me these technical questions. <laughs> if you ask me, I have to. Uh, um very um, um I have to ask the team to invite him uh, in order to, sure. to answer yeah. and speak. Yeah, I see me the yeah, all the measurements. Uh, please allow me to skip it <laughs> to speed up. Okay, the speed has to do is the 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 difference of the time that happens in the brain and the world and the uh, this balance of it will cause depression or mania. Okay. 
Okay, and two approach to neuroscience. Um, one is the mainstream and the functional based uh, approach. As I described, um, their research is trying to find correlation uh, between function of the activity and the brain. But, but this uh, approach can only measure the high frequency um, of the brain. The high fre frequency refers to cognition and based to emotion. But the most, the longer frequency where the self and consciousness uh, resides, is get their measure. And uh, Dr. Nottoff's uh, approach is to measure the longer frequency uh, of the brain, the spontaneous activity of the brain. So in his view, this special temporal neuroscience is more uh, the lower body, the lower end. And the upper, upper hand is the functional approach. And he does not reject those approach, but he says that they need some basic grounding so he can accommodate their research. Okay, so finally, um, the common currency he has found is the neural mental transformation. And it's a spatial temporal transformation. It's a dynamic uh, relation. So that is the essence of this theory. So, um, so I'm happy to see the idea of transformation from Zhuangzi gets uh, transported into neuroscience. And he refers to, to, the, to the paper of our um, um, level of time uh, in, in the Zhuangzi and the Leibniz. So uh, our recent collaboration involves translating uh, his book. So now I'm coming toward the end. The Spontaneous Brain, uh, published by M MIT Press. Uh, and we, the way we collaborate is that we translate it into Chinese, but also upon the request of Dr. Nottoff, we invite five scholars um, different disciplines to comment on five parts of his work. So we have uh, invited a brain scientist and neurologist and also um, cognitive uh, neuroscientist and also um, philosophers of science and ethics and also a philosopher, a, a religion scholar from Islam in Taiwan uh, is Professor Tsai Yuanlin. Yeah, he was the one who brought me to Malaysia 10 years ago. Yeah, he got his PhD in Islamic religion and philosophy from Temple University. So, and he had a background in political science. So we also invited him to comment on Dr. Nottoff's book because Dr. Nottoff's book is very philosophical and scientific at the same time. So it's very rich. So he can uh, do responding to these scholars from different disciplines, benefit from both sides. That's our idea. So we translated it. And two weeks ago, we presented it in the Taipei International Book Fair. And uh, I think it was a huge success. The the, the audience was uh, was it was uh, it, it was packed with with the crowd, and Dr. Nottoff uh, um, was also physically there, um, making it to the public, and the discussions and the host, they are from the Academia Sinica, the director of the Institute of Chinese Literature and Philosophy. Uh, to comment on the book on uh, brain science. So the, the, the kind of twist, uh, I think is part of the attraction um, for the audience. And then we also have a book for promotion uh, as a round table in one of the bookstore uh, in Taipei um, with a different combination of scholars. 
And this one is a smaller scale. So the, the discussion uh, was actually very lively, uh, packed with young people. So it's almost like a seminar in, in the university, uh, but it was in the bookstore. And uh, so Dr. Nodov was so thankful to the National Taiwan University Press. They were very supportive because this kind of book the, um, it is difficult to publish because the market is not very good, uh, but they are supportive. And so we visit them. Um, and actually they told, they told us that the sale was actually good. And uh, the day before, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. North of Dead for Canada, uh, he had a long time um, um, collaboration with us to, uh, to work with our students, right? Because our students, they, they, they mostly come from medicine, um, some from engineering. And that's how I feel about these students. They are very market talented but the current um, education trained them to be specialists. And that is a waste of their talents. I feel sorry for them um, yeah, deeply. Yeah, I really want to see some of them become Ibn Sina because they have these market talents. Um, so, um, so people like, Dr. Nautop, I think, would be a very good friend to join uh, into this kind of cultivation. Um, so, um, and he does not care whether uh, the, the collaborator is a professor or undergraduate, as far as they are motivated and they can bring ideas. So, um, because our work is so um, um, exciting, so we have to take some breaks, uh, fresh air. So we have to take him to climb the second tallest mountain uh, called Snow Mountain in Taiwan. And uh, the medical uh, student girl took us there because uh, we want to survive. So we have to rely on the professional. And, uh, you know, I, I've been climbing the mountains in Taiwan for so many times. And it was last week, Tuesday. It was the first time when I reached the peak, I hear the familiar Malaysian language. And then uh, I uh, checked with them and, and uh, they, yeah, I confirmed that they are from Malaysia. So uh, I asked them, do you have a national flag with you? And they say, yeah, they, so they find one. So that's where we took a picture. Yeah, so it must be destiny. Yeah. So, uh, so let me uh, bring to the conclusion. So I think tradition and culture are sources of inspirations for offering us possibility of worldviews. And these worldviews could enter deeply into the ways in which we engage with the world, including the ways in which we do science, such as neuroscience. The development of human civilization requires constant returning to an innovative revival of one's cultural roots through creative synthesis of disciplines in a contemporary context. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, thank you, Prof. That's a very wonderful uh, lecture. Maybe before uh, Dr. Ayn uh, uh, moderate the question and answer, I would like just to recognize the uh, presence of uh, Prof. Tamim and uh, Prof. Khaled and all our professors and doctors who are in the Zoom and YouTube also. I would like also to mention that this uh, uh, this event is collaborated with our uh, PPFPM, the Philosophy uh, Society of Malaysia here. And we welcome the, the, the president of the with us uh, here. Go ahead, sister. Okay, there are 
we have uh, several questions here online. Uh, my question is, there is a question from Fikri Swadu. My question is, if Northrop hold and stated that NP is fundamental for self and consciousness, how about the procedure of decoration in which all of the cortical structure of the brain will remove, but the animals and also human animals have not lost their consciousness? So then, uh, yeah, it's very so. Okay. The online participants can uh, refer to the chat box. It's quite a long uh, question, so Professor needs to read it. I think we can conclude that uh, the question of the soul, body, and uh, the relation between them has been a long debate since the beginning of man. Uh, but it shows how you know a, a life in this world which we call the natural world or the physical world is very much related to the world above us and even in between and this god-given organ called brain which performs the activity of thinking uh, together with a power called mind um, and this is where you know space and time comes into place and they do research on this and therefore the research about the brain and mind is essential in um, in understanding human uh, human human being and actually solving problems um, in technology you know where we, in the in the contemporary world where uh, some of us even fear of technology themselves where technology is actually created by human and this means that human does not understand themselves and uh, does not actually uh, grasp this uh, great activity of man which is thinking and this is where uh, neurophilosophy actually takes place and uh, we can answer the the fear of you know some people fearing gpt chat gpt and ai and everything so um okay we come up uh, maybe you can answer yes yeah. so um <coughs> So when you describe the uh, procedure of decortical um, decortification, uh, you are uh, meaning that the cortical structure of the brain uh, they get removed, uh, but somehow um, the animal uh, retains its consciousness. Um, so um, I mean, this question um, I'm not entirely in a position to answer because it requires the uh, phenomenon to be confirmed, right? That the, when the cortical uh, structure of the brain of the animal gets removed, whether the consciousness is retained, right? And I think experts in this field might answer, but let's suppose uh, this phenomenon is real. Um, I think my current understanding would be that um, the kind of uh, theory Dr. Northup is offering is that uh, the kind of spatial temporal complexity of the brain uh, can predict the kind of content and level of um, complexity of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a, a matter of degree. So he has done extensive study in the vegetative uh, patients, right? Those patients produce uh, consciousness almost permanently. So, um, so his uh, empirical study of their brain um, can predict the kind of correspondence. Those patients tend to have a very um, low level of spatial temporal complexity based on the three spatial temporal mechanisms that we just uh, mentioned. And those um, uh, measurements can uh, predict the kind of level and content of consciousness. So I think uh, the kind of um, um, study could be extended to study animal brains and their level of consciousness. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maybe you check if there are some people who want to pop there. Yes, um, anyone online, if uh, they want to raise their hands and maybe someone here um, in the room, you know, they're please, the, the, the floor is open for questions. 
Dr. Norul, there are a couple of interesting questions in the chat room. Dr. Norul, you can go. Just to inform him that we have one. Okay, we have one question here from Dr. Niza. We get you back. We'll get back to you later. I just want, uh, want to ask your opinion based on your research that I've seen so far. Uh, it's quite creative. Creative whenever you combine lots of traditions, lots of disciplines, right? But the thing is, being creative is quite risky. People tend to don't like new things. So how do you, um, how do you manage to uh, push your research towards uh, acceptance? Because it's very creative because uh, I think the scientific community people tend to abide by the rules, by the traditions. So how, uh, since I'm, I'm a very young researcher in, in my field, so I thought maybe you have some advice or you can share your experience as well. Yeah, yeah so thank you. This is a very um, critical, but also very important uh, question and uh, that we also face uh, ourselves. Um, so as you see, um, our academic environment um, is getting more and more specialized. Um, so, and we all have to survive. Mm -hmm. And to survive, we have to publish papers. But papers are reviewed by our um, colleagues uh, who are specialized. Um, so, so for this kind of um, interdisciplinary work uh, to be really uh, innovative, they tend to be rejected most of the time. Um, and that makes it difficult to survive. Um, so, so myself, I went through that process. So my research awards is a proof of that. Mm -hmm. I wrote all those uh, specialized papers, which now I don't want to look at. <laughs> nice. So technical and contains so little content, of course, it's hard work, requires a lot of efforts, and there is some solid work in it, but it's not intellectually satisfying, not to my heart. Yeah. So my paper on Zhuangzi was the first paper I feel so satisfied. But, but do you see any direction towards the community uh, being open towards this new kind of direction? The one that, that you are looking right now. Yeah. But you combine several traditions into, into research. You so, see that there's a trend itself. Yeah. So there are two ways we are working on now. One is with young people. Because young people, they don't have so much baggage, uh, like, a, a, like a burden, especially undergraduates. Mm -hmm. That's why. Most of the students working with me are undergraduate students because they, they don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but they are bright young people. They are the best young people in our country. And they are bored by their medicine. Medicine is so boring. It's not what I said, they told me. Most of them, they told me the same thing. It's all memorization. So they need to have some space for breathing fresh air. That's why they have to come to us. We are their savior. But of course we also need them. <laughs> but, so that's one thing. And second is that we, we try to work with people from different, with similar spirits from different cultures, different orientation. So I think that's part of the reason that drive us here, that the fact I'm sitting here in a very uh, different culture and with uh, such a diverse cultures like Malaysia. And 10 years ago, I it was my first time visiting here, but I find myself going deeper and deeper into Malaysia. Yeah, because the culture and language is so rich that it's very natural for me to get uh, my ideas and difficulties and crisis through to you. So that is another way we, we welcome it. 
I mean, in the mainstream, we, we are okay, we survive, but we know how to survive. But that's not the reason or the, the, or the motivation we come into this pursuit. Yeah, so we want to remain uh, faithful to, to that momentum. Yes. We have some people that are Yeah, we have uh, someone online, uh, Dr. Ahmad Sali, please. Yeah, I um, had a few thoughts as you were speaking. I'm glad to hear that you're connected to the mind and cognitive uh, faculty uh, philosophy, but I see you here using the word brain more often. And I wonder by using just the word brain, you are um, placed an octopus, a large octopus in, in a small glass jar, because there's definitely a difference between brain and the heart. And right now within Islamic tradition, we have so many levels of intelligence. And there's even now research that shows that even in our gut, there are 512 million uh, uh, type of uh, cells that has a certain different type of intelligence. And every uh, one of the 70 trillion cells has uh, a unique intelligence. So I, I actually like from the Islamic perspective to hear the word intelligence rather than just uh, brain and then heart with a capital H and mind with a capital M. I'm thinking your difference you mentioned about the Far Eastern tradition that could grasp things instantly compared to the Western uh, tradition. And uh, there you think perhaps of the martial arts and how some of these uh, masters could find, fight blindfolded and almost see with a third eye. How do we explain the vibrational therapy when opera singer can break a glass uh, getting a certain frequency? Uh, but in the Islamic tradition, we also have the concept of the mi'raj where the prophet of Islam traveled through black holes and outer space all within uh, zero time and uh, with the speed of lightning. And so that goes beyond these analogies of just moving from a slow train to a bullet train, speaking of teleportation and telepathy. And the last thought I have is perhaps we should look outside academia, maybe at the studies of Gita and the student of Gita like Rudolf Steiner and the student of Steiner, which is Stein and anthroposophy and how they could uh, perceive uh, different type of thinking beings and astral uh, um, and ego uh, beings and, and spiritual soul beings, etc. Et so um, I think you have some interesting thoughts. It would be just interesting that you would maybe get in uh, the type of thoughts of a Hussein Nasser, that type of deep tasawuf and spiritual thinking and uh, take this uh, from beyond the material and go from just a basic material and go much more into the deeper mind and art with the capital H and all those other type of uh, sciences. Yeah, so um, because of the distance, I might not catch uh, all of the nuances in your question, uh, but let me try to um, um, re response. Um, one, you mentioned about the connection of the brain to the heart. Um, and uh, so I, I think somehow the heart um, or the kind of body is uh, missing uh, from, uh, seems, uh, from Dr. North of our research. Um, but I would say that um, it's not missing uh, because uh, his uh, view of the, the brain uh, is special temporal dynamics. And so the brain has to have its uh, special temporal alignment with the world and with the body. So um, so the heart is, uh, is uh, naturally a very important part of this uh, special temporal structure. Uh, that's one general picture. Um, but uh, we actually raise a similar concern to him uh, from the perspective of Chinese uh, medicine. Um, because uh, in the Chinese medicine, brain is not occupying a central role uh, in the way uh, Chinese medicine look at human health. Um, and uh, they look at the meridians um, that uh, connect different parts of our body. And 
merit and achieve, right? So actually it's of my uh, primary interest to connect in um, the idea of qi and meridians to the you know, special temporal neuroscience of Dr. Noto, uh, because both um, involve an important notion of frequency and resonance um, that is not confined to the material uh, organs that, are, that seems to be isolated. So, um, so actually, in the uh, the trip that Dr. Notov just undertook uh, this time to Taiwan, uh, we have arranged uh, Dr. Notov to interact with some of our um, young doctors, where uh, from our group, right? We corrupted them <laughs> since they were freshmen, so it worked for ten years. Yeah, this. Young doctors, now they are doctors. Um, they are trained in the Western tradition, but, uh, but their hearts belong to Chinese tradition. Um, so, uh, so, um, so now they get exposed to Dr. Nordhoff's special temporal neuroscience. They immediately see the connection. So now they are trying to uh, convince Dr. Nordhoff that. His special temporal neuroscience can be integrated with Chinese medicine. So that is our newest project. So it is on the way. Um, and yeah, so and and then you also mentioned about the, the kind of uh, very special experience, right? And I think those kind of experience could be observed in meditation. Right, and some of the greatest uh, religious figures, they go to the big cave uh, to do meditation for um, uh, 40 days or, or, or longer. So I, I think um, the kind of uh, experience must be very different and due to the kind of spatial temporal um, uh, kind of alignment in that kind of environment. And so meditation, is now one of the research topics of Dr. Nordhoff and our group, which he's currently doing. Um, so now we are working with uh, a, a Buddhist um, um, center in Taiwan. It's called Dhamma Drum Institute of Liberal Arts. It's one of the most intellectual Buddhist um, um, institution in Taiwan. Um, and um, they are open um, luckily, uh, to scientific research, uh, because uh, they also send some young monks to my institute to study philosophy, um, because they have the crisis of uh, um, having less and less young people to become monks. So, um, so they also need to adapt uh, to the change of the time. Um, so, naturally, we are working together on that. Um, so hopefully that answers some of your questions. Thank you. Maybe I should add to this, like, you know, um, uh, we, as, as Muslims, we usually only look into the soul perspective without looking at uh, the relation or correlation that the soul has with the body. And this is where uh, neurophilosophy is doing its job, you know, uh, to see this correlation, you know, happening. And uh, maybe this, uh, what you call uh, the theory of the spontaneous brain is actually uh, 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 contributing to, um, uh, to producing synapses in the brain. And uh, this is where uh, they are trying to see uh, where the self, you know, we also, we, we usually see the self as um, not connected to time, uh, to, to this law of, uh, of the world, physical world. But it's actually the body where we, we are right now in this world, where we have body and soul actually connects together. And this is where um, they're trying to look at, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we have one more question from uh, Nuruddin. Uh, he's from Indonesia. He's asking that I also want to ask your opinion about the current development of AI, like a chat GPT, especially those that lead to arm races, referring to Time Magazine. What is the relationship between the human brain and AI and the digital world? 
which is also modeled on the human brain from neuroclassical perspective and maybe from uh, Zhuangzi uh, philosophy. Thank you. Yeah. Well, wow, this is a, a big, big, big research topic that will be for, you know, another um, at least 10 years. And uh, it's actually one of the research topics that Dr. Noto, uh is currently undertaking. Uh, he has a, a big project uh, in Europe uh, with uh, uh, Carl Friston, uh, who is uh, uh, what the, probably the, the, the most important person in AI um, and working on artificial intelligence. And um, they want to build a connection between um, the computer science uh, with the human brain. Uh, so, so that's why uh, Dr. Noto was involved because his uh, spatial temporal dimension uh, is very different. Um, so from this perspective uh, of spatial temporal, we can really uh, kind of examine the nature of artificial intelligence. I mean, somehow we can predict that if Dr. Northup's theory uh, has any uh, plausibility um, for real AI to, to take place, uh, the kind of spatial temporal alignment must exist uh, between the, the robots and the environment. So that's uh, one very, very general insight uh, that we might gain from his perspective. And the second thing is that uh, Dr. Nottoff now is also um, um, actually opening up a company. Yeah, that's another thing we are reacting to our um, difficult uh, kind of academic environment, right? Because our academic environment tend to be very specialized, but we want to contribute to the welfare of the world. So naturally, we want to have, have a little bit more of the freedom to kind of to, to do research without so much constraint um, and then to attract young people uh, because more and more young people they, now they don't want to go to the academic and and then they go directly to the business to the industry which is making money so it's, it's not a good uh, uh, direction so it's better to have uh, somewhere common ground. Um, so, so Dr. Nottoff's uh, part of his company is to develop a uh, robot, AI. So that, for example, um, if you can design a robot that can speak to a patient um, based on the spatial temporal uh, dimension of the patient, because a depression patient, as I said, my listen to the, the 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 mother or the friends. The speed is too fast for for him. So, but it's difficult for us, being the friends, to talk slower because it's out of our control. Right? But if a robot can talk a little bit faster than the spatial temporal uh, dimension of the patient, then the patient can. Uh, recover uh, slowly, right? So, so that explains the kind of relevance of the kind of spatial temporal um, neuroscience that the note of uh, creates in connection to the development of AI, right? But um, to have a full scale of, of uh, investigation into this connection, it really requires um, more um, um, collaborative teamwork. Yeah. Anyone in the okay? Um, do we have any more questions? Uh, raise hands, please. Zoom. On the Zoom. Okay. If no question, I have one. Okay. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, we have some people. Go ahead. Fine. Okay. Okay. So they normally best do a proper and they use this tag to They can ask a question before or to your email Can you take the mic? You can get a little bit of a So I have a little thing about that's the question. I think both about the 
Yeah, thank you uh, for your question. I really admire your um, um, really the effort to introduce Zhangzi to the Malay world. Um, because I, when I find myself uh, doing the same thing in Taiwan, it's difficult. I mean, the, the, the Zhangzi was written uh, in the Kenshin classic Chinese, and it's like another language. So um, even for me to understand it is difficult, and uh, and to 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 introduce it to people there and to the students there, um, they yeah they will respond why do I have to care uh, about these classics? Um, so I think in general um, to introduce the classics to the contemporary time um, is like. Um, irrelevance, waste of time, etc. Um, so, so that is in general difficult, right? And especially you want to introduce it in a different culture, um, the kind of uh, irrelevance might be doubled up. So for example, um, um, we want to introduce Ibn Sina's um, work uh, to our students in Taiwan. And then they uh, they say who is Ibn Sina? <laughs> we are so foreign, really so foreign to uh, to Islamic culture in Taiwan. Um, I think to the Chinese speaking world, I think Islamic culture is very foreign to us. Mm -hmm. So if we want to do the same, then I think you probably encounter more difficulty than you are here. So we are speaking about a general phenomenon. Um, so, so that's why, I mean, my strategy, uh, of course, I don't use it as a strategy, but na it's naturally developed. So the strategy is somehow um, to, let's say, because science or medicine, they are the, our common language in, in a contemporary context. And if philosophy has any depth or any content in it, uh, we have to bring the content to science and medicine so that they see the relevance. So that's uh, our strategy. Yeah. So yeah. So because I've been working in the school of humanities in the university in Taiwan, and we are always put in the most remote building in the campus. <laughs> we have to climb all the mountains in order to get to my office uh, because we are considered as uh, irrelevant, <laughs> if not useless. Um, you know, even though we come from the engineering background, um, like, as if we have to do the engineering work in order to show we are capable of something uh, before we do some humanity work. Um, so, um, but we know that importance of humanities that's why we are doing it here and now. So, but because of the environment, uh, I learned to speak their language in order to get our ideas through. 
So that's the strategy. Um, so, so working with people like Dr. Northup, and actually he is in the same situation himself, right? Because he tried to find his way out. So naturally we work together. And I think because the work is so interesting, so no one can stop us from doing it. Uh, but importantly, we have to find uh, similar spirit people to work together. And then there's always hope. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, Professor Kahn, when we when we talk about future, it's uh, people always think it's irrele irrelevant. Um, but actually, we're, we're preparing for the future where uh, there might be jobs that uh, don't even name, don't have names uh, for today. So um, we need to actually uh, uh, develop people with this essential skill through uh, integrating disciplines uh, to come to you know to 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 come to solutions. Uh, that are more sustainable, holistic, inclusive, and best possible. <laughs> right. Um, I think that's all. Um, I think uh, we should continue with yeah, yeah, the yeah, Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, yeah, this is a wonderful talk and thinking. In fact, you just proved to me that the Quran mm -hmm. is correct. Mm -hmm. And that's another evidence that the Quran is a very deep text. In the, other, in the end, it's the word of God. But what you are saying scientifically here just showed today how science is very far from understanding the human, very far from understanding what is natural world. And actually, these are some epistemological issues in the Western uh, epistemology and uh, the scientific methodology. So they so 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 we, we are just restricting ourselves from a big space and horizon of knowledge mm -hmm. which God promised for us to get. So it's wonderful to hear from a specialist and your mentor, doctor, mm -hmm. is really doing a great job and talking about transformation, brain, mind. But this Quran talks about the bigger transformation. Mm -hmm. Which I think, it, looking at what science is doing today, what philosophy is doing today, we will take another 200 years to understand who we are. Because the Quranic model or view of the human is very wonderful. Talking about the human, which is, who is one of the creatures of God, just one creature of God, and that human with the brain, with the mind, with the senses, with the soul, with the heart, with the innate, the fitra, the human nature, we still don't understand what is this human. We don't even, we are unable to link between mind and heart and soul and body and the world. So, so means we are not advanced actually. When it comes to what is the horizon of the philosophical approach of the Quran, when we talk about the human, this human with this unified understanding of the human, where there is no um, separation between the mind, the heart, the soul, and the action, and the deeds, and the motivation. But unfortunately, science cannot discover this because we segment the specializations, the methods, mm -hmm. all this. Mm -hmm. That's why we need first mm -hmm. to redefine things mm -hmm. and put things in context so that we understand the human. And this human is actually, we cannot understand the human if we don't understand the natural world. So from the human with this understanding where you have the mind, the heart, the soul, the body, the innate, the human nature, and this natural world, and this natural world is just a simple level related to the, the, the human, because behind this natural world, we have the spiritual world. That's why when the Quran defines what does mean world, it's the world or reality, not like Immanuel Kant, or maybe Descartes, or maybe Derrida, or Foucault, or Habermas where they, they try to 
bring that bigger design, but still we are within that natural world. But there is a big thing behind the natural world where we have the spiritual world and how the spiritual world is linked to the natural and natural to the human. And the human is linked to a bigger level, which is the unseen. Because here, the understanding of the world is very important because that's a reality. Reality is not only the world, it's not only the human, but actually the unseen. And behind the unseen, that is the creator. So all these spaces, our epistemology and philosophy, need to understand how dynamics mm -hmm. and understanding happens. Here, anything happens in the spiritual world or the unseen world or in the natural world actually influences your brain, my brain, my mind, your mind, your heart, your heart. But what is the epistemology that explains this? Mm -hmm. So that's why what you are doing is wonderful. Uh, I hope our Muslim philosophers and Muslim scientists go to this to this real business of coming up with this kind of understanding. That's why I see what your mentor, the prof, and you doing is wonderful. And this place here is that is a great place for you to come and put your ideas here and deal with our philosophers. And not only Ibn Sina or Al Kindi or Al Farabi or all this ulama and Ghazali, but we have to create the epistemology of the future, which puts all these things together. Otherwise, I think we will be very far from understanding the human. So to me, all this starts from redefining who is the human, what is the natural world, what is the spiritual world, and how these things are linked together, and then science comes and give us the laboratory experience to show this. So as I say, we will take 200 years in this space to reach what the Quran is talking. I don't want to give a lecture, but later <laughs> on I will give you a lecture and tell you how the Quran links all these things together so that we, we save time of the world and people to understand the relation between space and time. So, Prof, I think that's really wonderful. You are doing a great job, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to hear all this. And I think we need to move forward in developing this kind of unified epistemology mm -hmm. and uh, worldview, because I noticed that the scientific reconstruction of reality having problem, the philosophical reconstruction of reality having problem, and we need to get a model where we put things together, then we can link between what does mean God, nature, world, human, empathy, compassion, love, care. We will all see them in a different understanding. Then we discover who is the human. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation. So uh, this is really great. Uh, that's what I want to just to comment. Uh, but you can go ahead. I think we need to end because uh, the time also we already almost spent two hours. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. no, I think it's the end. Um, it's beautifully concluded by, by uh, Professor Abdul Aziz, uh, our dean. Um, so I will end this session. Thank you, Prof. Kai. Thank you. And yes. So, so uh, thank you very much once again. I'd like to thank Prof. Kai for this wonderful lecture, thoughts, ideas, and also your mentor. If I can bring him to talk in this tech here, will be a great thing to do be happy before to be I here. leave the place. <laughs> okay, so please, uh, we welcome him, we invite him from this place here, and we hope to see him and talk to him and discuss uh, in whatever format. I would like also to thank the philosophy. Uh, and our collaborator for the great job. I want to thank this Dr. Rain, is a very great, wonderful lady who is here newly appointed in the sector, and she is doing a great job. And the first job is inviting you, Prof. Thank you. So uh, I want to thank Sister Jureta and uh, our sister Kai, this great woman here who is the dynamo of uh, preparing all these things. Of course, this great man over there, Brother Muzambi, is a great, and all our invited brothers who came from other institutions. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, all our people here, and the great people who are in the Zoom.
And in the UK, these are the great friends of Istanbul. They always support us and come and learn and give their views and ideas, though they have a lot of things today to do, <laughs> but they are loyal to us. This is very wonderful thing to do. Uh, with this one, uh, I thank you all, and we end our uh, stack World Professorial Lecture number 19 with saying, May God bless you all, and we will see you in number 20 soon, inshallah. Thank you, Prof. Once again. Assalamu alaikum.